It is Wednesday evening, January 25th, 2023, and we're here together at the Four Lakes Church of Christ tonight in Madison, Wisconsin, for the purpose of studying from the book of Genesis. So we're in Genesis chapter 34 tonight, so we want to invite you to be joining us in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and we're starting chapter 34 in just a few moments, but we're very glad that you found us tonight. We're glad that you've taken the time out of your week to watch this class and to participate in some way, and we also want to invite you to join us in person this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 for Bible class. We're about two-thirds of the way through the book of Ephesians. And then join us again for the worship assembly starting at 10.30. This week we're taking a break from our study of Hebrews. As I said that we would a few weeks ago, we're not going straight through. We're taking some uh, detours here and there, but we'll be having a song service this week uh, structured around the concept of Jesus being our Savior. So we'll have a number of extra scripture readings, uh, an extra song or two. The lesson will be shorter. But I am looking forward to coming together and studying Jesus as our Savior this coming Lord's Day morning. That's the purpose for us coming together is to worship God. And this is certainly one way of doing that. If you have any questions about class tonight or any concerns about what you see or hear, if you'd like clarification on something, if you have something that we need to be thinking about in our prayers and going to God on your behalf, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. And if you've not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, this would be a great time to do that. And that way you can get updates whenever something new is released. So I hope you will do that for us. We'd really appreciate that. Tonight we're back to the book of Genesis. So the book of beginnings written by Moses. And we're now looking at the life of Jacob. And after being separated from his family for about 20 years, after having been on the run for that length of time, Jacob has now been reunited with his brother Esau, and he's now back in the promised land. And by way of review, we learned in the last few verses of chapter 33 that when he arrives in the promised land, Jacob camps out and then he purchases the land where he's camping. And he makes this purchase from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father. So the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, and that'll be significant in tonight's study. We'll get back to that in just a moment. But he moves on to this land along with his two wives, their two maids, and their 12 children, 11 boys and one girl by the name of Dinah. By way of just very brief review, just bringing us up to speed on the chart here again, Leah starts out with the first four sons. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Uh, Rachel feels left out. She is barren. She's unable to have children, so she allows Jacob to go into her maid, Bilhah, who bears Dan and Naphtali. Well, that makes Leah worried about falling behind, and so she has Jacob go into her maid, Zilpah, who then bears Gad and Asher. And so then Leah takes the lead again with Issachar, Zebulun, and the one daughter of the family, Dinah. And toward the end of Genesis 30, a few weeks ago, we had Rachel bearing Joseph, her firstborn. So that brings us to 11 sons and one daughter in this family of one husband and basically four wives, two official wives and then two maids who were considered as his wives in a few different passages. So I've left Benjamin on the chart here, but he's grayed out. So he's son number 12. He hasn't been born yet, so we'll get to him soon. But we're just keeping these all on here so we can try to keep some of this straight. And this has been a very uh, helpful chart to me over the past few weeks. I hope it has been to you as well. Uh, tonight we pick up with an absolutely terrible thing happening to Dinah as this family moves into their new land. Uh, before we get there, though, I would just ask, how do you think Dinah is feeling as the next to the youngest and the only daughter in a family with 11 sons? What do you think that's like? I don't know if any of you have been in that position. I kind of doubt it. People are having a lot fewer kids than they used to. Uh, you think she might have been picked on from time to time? I would imagine so, probably. Um, but do you think those brothers might have been at least a little bit protective of their little sister? I am thinking so, and we're going to see that in tonight's class. So let's start tonight by looking at the first paragraph. This is Genesis chapter 34, verses 1 through 4. Genesis 34 verses 1 through 4. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. When Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he took her and lay with her by force. He was deeply attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this young girl for a wife. 
Now, the villain here obviously is Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite. The, the whole relationship thing is uh, really blowing my mind, figuring out who this guy is. I mean, at the end of the previous chapter, Jacob buys the land from the sons of Shechem, Hamor's father. <laughs> and I tried to let that soak in and try to think through that, trying to figure that out. And at first I'm thinking that Shechem then must have been the head of the whole clan because Jacob bought the land from Shechem's sons. Um, however, in this passage, we're introduced to Shechem's father, Hamor. And so apparently Hamor is the patriarch here. Shechem is the son. And I, I think I would describe him as a spoiled, rotten kid who's used to getting everything his way. And uh, I think that would certainly fit in with the reference here in verse 2 to Shechem being the prince of the land. So he's not really the king, uh, but he's a prince. So he's kind of biding his time, waiting maybe until his father dies so he can take over uh, full time. But his dad is above him. Maybe his dad is elderly. Uh, maybe his dad is in the process of turning things over to his son, but that process isn't quite complete yet. So that's the best I can make of that. If you have a better idea... Uh, leave that in the comments or send me a text or an email. I'd love to hear from you. So this is what happens. When Jacob and his family move in, uh, Dinah, the daughter, next to the youngest in the family, she heads out to visit the daughters of the land. In other words, growing up in a family with all boys, I would just take this to mean that uh, Dinah wants to meet some girls. <laughs> She's never had girls to hang out with. And so maybe as a teenager, maybe even younger, we're not really told her age here, but she goes out to try to get some know some girls in this area. And she's just kind of wandering around, minding her own business. Not a problem with doing that. But I think we see the difference between maybe the land where they came from and the land where they're showing up. I think probably Jacob, probably all of them misjudge how evil this area was. Remember the whole situation with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah a number of years earlier. So th they're, they're moving into a, a terrible situation and maybe they really don't uh, realize how bad it is. But she goes out, she, she's trying to get to know some uh, other girls from this area. But of course, as she's out there looking for some friends very innocently, uh, Shechem, the prince of this land, sees this young woman and he takes her and he lays with her by force. So he rapes her. And verse 3 tells us that he... Uh, pretty much thinks that he's in love. And um, what a disgusting situation. So he's deeply attracted to this young woman. And so after laying with her by force, he demands that his father go get her and, uh, you know, give her to me as a wife. So he's demanding that his dad make this happen. And again, this is why I think of this guy as a spoiled brat, probably just accustomed to getting everything his way, even ordering his uh, father to, to do this kind of thing. And I think we can think of other people in the Bible who were uh, similar in their attitude. I believe Samson uh, did something very similar. So uh, in this situation, this young man knows that his dad would probably give him whatever he wanted. And so he's done this terrible thing and he just says, Dad, I want her. Go get her for me. And uh, ordering his dad in that way. So let's continue then and see what happens next. This is Genesis 34 and let's go on to verses 5 through 7. Genesis 34 verses 5 through 7. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, but his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob kept silent until they came in. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing ought not to be done." At this point, I don't think we're sure whether Jacob is being a coward here or whether he's being wise in waiting for backup. We don't really have a firm answer to that question in the context here. But when he hears about what Shechem has done to his daughter, he keeps silent. So that's his first reaction. So whatever the reasoning behind that is, um, dad doesn't say anything. So he doesn't say anything, doesn't do anything, but he waits. And his sons are out there with the livestock in the fields, and so he waits until they come back. And uh, then he tells his sons what has happened. It seems that, they, that they've kind of heard about this. So it seems to me as if they know based on the text here. Uh, Hamor, the rapist's father, now comes in. And we aren't told what happens in that conversation exactly. It's probably safe to assume that he's looking to arrange a marriage between his son Shechem and Jacob's daughter Dinah. You know, we don't know that until later. I'm just saying what we know right now. And so the, the sons come in, they overhear this, they're incredibly angry, um, very angry, outraged. Uh, this is just an atrocity, this is a terrible thing. Uh, this past Sunday, by the way, you may remember if you were in class with us, I hope you were, but we looked at Paul's instruction to be angry. 
Remember that passage in Ephesians chapter 4? There is a command in the Bible that says, be angry. And I think this is one of those times, obviously, when we need to be angry. And I would say that uh, sometimes not being angry is a sin. If something happens that God would be angry about and we're not angry about it, that's a problem. So we need to be angry about the same things God is angry with. And uh, this is absolutely one of those times. This is something disgraceful. It ought not to be done. And so the question is, what do we do about it at this point? So let's continue then with Genesis 34, verses 8 through 12. Genesis 34, verses 8 through 12. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us, give your daughters to us, and take our daughters for yourselves. Thus you shall live with us, and the land shall be opened before you. Live and trade in it, and acquire property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, If I find favor in your sight, then I will give whatever you say to me. Ask me ever so much bridal payment and gift, and I will give according as you say to me. But give me the girl in marriage. Well, here we have the details that we didn't know previously. Hamer tells uh, Jacob that the soul of his son longs for his daughter. So my son is in love with your daughter. And he not only asks for Dinah to be given to his son in marriage, but he proposes that we all marry each other. Let's just fully merge our two families. And the benefit for Jacob is that this leads to an open door. If you overlook this little indiscretion that's taken place, you can trade with us. And you can have lots of stuff. And we'll just get along and we'll all be friendly with each other. And then Hamor tells Jacob to name his price. If you will just let this happen, just, just tell us whatever we need to do. Whatever the price may be, I'll pay it. But we want your girl in marriage. Before we move to the next paragraph, let's just say these people have messed with the wrong family, haven't they? They've messed with the wrong family. First of all, Jacob is known for coming out on top of just about every negotiation that he's ever had in his whole life, right? Secondly, the head of this family has forced himself on a young woman with 10 older brothers from four different mothers. Can you imagine growing up in a situation like that and how protective they would be toward their little sister? All kinds of things. I mean, this is a huge family that they've, uh, that they've wronged. All right, let's continue on with Genesis chapter 34, verses 13 through 17. Let's notice what happens next. Genesis 34, verses 13 through 17. But Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. They said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you, if you will become like us, in that every male of you be circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters for ourselves, and we will live with you and become one people." But if you will not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and go. Now let's notice, first of all, Jacob isn't the one to answer Hamor, is he? But Jacob's sons are the ones who answer Hamor. And I'm not exactly sure why, but I'm open to the possibility that the sons, first of all, are so mad. And I think maybe they can see their father's not going to get this done, and so that may be a part of it. But secondly, they may be worried that their father might really wobble on this one that he doesn't have the guts to do it. And I think that's all kind of wrapped up here. And so the sons, they, they speak up first. And notice Moses, the author of this passage, tells us that they answer Hamor with deceit. And so this isn't something they uh, threw together right at this moment. It seems as if they had planned this. So they see where this is going. They have a goal in mind. They see where this is heading from the beginning. And, of course, they get right into it. They say nothing of what this guy has done to their sister. They don't even bring this up in the negotiation. Uh, but they give some kind of hope here. You know, basically, yeah, you know, we'd love to have you uh, merge with our family. We'd love to give you our sister. Uh, but there's no way we can do this unless you're circumcised, unless you become like us. So we'll give you our sister on one condition, and that is you and every male among you must be circumcised. And then we'll all swap daughters, and then we'll all live together happily ever after. But if you don't do this, no way. 
So these are our terms. Notice there's no uh, huge dowry. There's no payment. This is it. Just this one little thing. If you just do this, then we'll be fine and we'll all get along together and live uh, from here on out. So let's continue then with Genesis 34 verses 18 through 24. Genesis 34 verses 18 through 24. Now their words seemed reasonable to Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. The young man did not delude, delay to do the thing because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was more respected than all the household of his father. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city saying, these men are friendly with us. Therefore, let them live in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage and give our daughters to them. Only on this condition will the men consent to us to live with us, to become like one people, that every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock and their property and all their animals be ours? Only let us consent to them and they will live with us. All who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and to his son Shechem. And every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. Well, basically, Shechem is willing to do whatever it takes. He's in, and he's first in line. Seems like he does it right there on the spot, really. You know, he wants Dinah no matter what these guys want him to do. So if this is it, then I'm going to do it. And so now he turns around and he pitches this to the whole city. What a weird request, isn't it? You imagine going into a city with that request, but it seems that he's respected in the area. And so he explains the situation. These are the benefits that we'll receive. We'll have a whole new pool of women to choose from. Um, you know, they can take all of Jacob's livestock and his property through marriage. What's theirs will be ours. And to get all of this, all of these benefits, we just need to do this one little thing. And so he pitches this to the city. And I don't know why, but I thought of uh, uh, Mr. T here, um, pity the fool, <laughs> pity the fool who thinks he can outwit Jacob and Jacob's family by getting circumcised to take all his livestock away. Uh, Laban has already tried the whole livestock deception thing. It did not work out in his favor. But anyway, they agree to this. Uh, every male is circumcised, every male who went out of the gate of the city at the end of verse 24. It's, it's almost like a circumcision toll booth there at the end. Uh, everybody who went out or through this gate had this procedure done. So let's continue then tonight with Genesis 34 verses 25 through 29. Genesis 34, 25 through 29. Now it came about on the third day when they were in pain that two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came upon the city unawares and killed every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went forth. Jacob's sons came upon the slain and looted the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and that which was in the city and that which was in the field. And they captured and looted all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives, even all that was in the houses. As these men are recovering, therefore, Simeon and Levi swoop in as planned. This was in the plan from day one. And they, just between the two of them, uh, come into the city, they kill every male with the edge of the sword, including Hamor and his son Shechem. It seems starting with them. They then rescue their sister Dinah from Shechem's house. They leave. And then in verse 24, this is something I don't really remember before from reading this account, but the rest of Jacob's sons come in and they loot the city. And I always thought it was just the two. And I say always, I mean, I've read this passage before, so I knew this in a sense, but in my mind, it's just the two of them. But the others come in and they loot. And so they take everything because Shechem had defiled their sister. This is the purpose. They're mad and uh, they take it all. Flocks, herds, donkeys, crops, wealth, children, wives, everything in any house, even out in the fields, they take all of it. So completely killing and looting everybody from this whole town. So let's conclude tonight by looking at the last paragraph. This is Genesis 34 verses 30 and 31. Genesis 34 verses 30 and 31. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and my men being few in number, they will gather together against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed, I and my household. But they said, Should he treat our sister as a harlot? 
In response to the slaughter and the looting of Shechem and all of their people, Jacob is concerned about what? His reputation. Jacob is concerned that his sons have made him odious. They have made him stink among the locals. And so he's worried that the others might band together and retaliate. You know, as a dad, I'm not, uh, I'm not really liking Jacob's reaction here. I don't know about you or the other dads or parents in the uh, group tonight who may be watching this, but uh, I'm kind of disappointed in Jacob's reaction here. And I know maybe we could argue that the sons overreacted, and, and certainly looking back on it, they did. They took this, they killed people who probably were not directly responsible. Um, but I think we can definitely make the case that Jacob underreacted. Okay, so his sons might have overreacted, but Jacob, at least twice now, at the beginning and now here, he underreacted. And uh, seems to uh, reprimand his sons for what they've done here. And, uh, and it is. It's over-the-top brutal and deceptive. It's just terrible, rolled all into one. But the sons of Jacob basically respond, should this man be able to get away with treating our son or daughter, our sister, like a prostitute? And obviously their answer is no. So they see themselves as having fulfilled their duty as brothers. We just did what we had to do. We had no choice here. And uh, they have brought about some sense of justice to their sister when nobody else was willing to do it. In fact, it as I said earlier, it seems that Jacob might have been willing to kind of overlook this at the beginning of this chapter. Well, I think we understand today that when the courts fail to deliver justice, people have a way of bringing justice on their own. If there's a vacuum in the, the field of justice, people have a way of getting things done. And, and certainly that seems to be what happens here. Shechem was the prince of this area, basically king. His dad was ruling. He was kind of the practical ruler. And he thought of himself as being above the law. And so when rulers get away with stuff, when they ignore the law, the people under their rule have a way of retaliating and uh, getting back at that and settling scores. And so in a sense, the sons of Jacob brought the law when the law was unwilling to enforce this sense of morality. This is something really that just should not be done. Well, this brings us to the end of Genesis 34. Jacob and his family have moved back into the promised land. And uh, when the one daughter of the family gets raped by a local prince, Jacob's sons plot some revenge and restitution through deceit. And these young men get it done. Uh, ultimately, Simeon and Levi will lose out on some blessings at the end of Jacob's life over this incident. If you have a Bible, you may want to turn over to Genesis 49. There's a kind of a whole chapter there, basically what we would describe today as a living will, where the head of a family passes along some blessing to his children. And so on his deathbed, Jacob calls all of his sons together and he addresses them and he kind of goes down the line and says something about each one. And this is what he says. This is Genesis 49 verses 5 and 6 as he's about to die. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their council. Let not my glory be united with their assembly. Because in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel." We learn something on both sides of this tonight, I believe. On one hand, there are times when we need to be angry. We have to be angry at what makes God angry. And Jacob didn't quite have that level of anger that he needed, in my opinion, as I look through this chapter. But on the other hand, we also need to be careful that when we're angry, we do not sin. And of course, that's the other half of that command over in the book of Ephesians that we study this past Lord's Day. Being angry at something doesn't give us a right to slaughter entire villages. And so our anger has to be controlled. We have to be able to be angry without sinning. And so with that, that's the practical application as I see it of Genesis chapter 34. We're glad that you joined us tonight. And again, I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 9.30. We'll get back to Ephesians, and then after class, come together for the worship assembly at 10.30. And we'll have a song service. We try to do that on the fifth Sunday, whenever we have one, a few times a year, where we have the shorter lesson, and we try to organize our songs and some scripture readings around a theme. So let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are a God of justice, and you are a God who sees. You see us. 
You see what happens to us. You see when we've been wronged. You see when we wrong others. You see what we do to other people and what they do to us. But you know our hearts. And so we ask tonight that we would see ourselves just as you see us. We ask, Father, that we would look out for others, that we would protect, that we would defend those who are being taken advantage of by the world. We pray that we would be angry at whatever it is that makes you angry and that we would respond as you would have us respond in all situations. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.